Uh, last spot. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll call this July 25th, 2019 meeting of AMAT's Policy Committee to order. Uh, the time is 1.30, so we'll go right on time. Quick roll call, Mr. Peterson. Friendly. Mr. Constant. Mr. Weddleton. Here. Mr. Schutte. Here. Ms. Heil. Here. All right. We're going to show that we have five people and I have a quorum for this meeting. Craig, would you please go ahead and do the public involvement? Yes, all AMATS meetings are open to the public. If we have a business item, we'll have a presentation by staff or a consultant. And then the committee will be given a chance to discuss it. And then after that, the public will be invited to comment on the items. Thank you. On to item four, approval of the meeting minutes. Um, do we have a motion for changes? So moved. Second. Okay. Meeting minutes for 27 June are approved. Uh, Mr. Chair, oh, you need to approve the agenda first. Oh, I'm sorry. Approve the agenda. Back up a little bit. Okay. Uh, any Move to approve the agenda. Second. 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 Agenda is approved. Now no, on to meeting minutes. Sorry, it's number four. Forgot to take the vote. Having problems. Yeah. He asked him to change his minutes. Yeah. So. Got a date or something? Fix <laughs> that script, Craig. This is Mocha. It's way too. I mean, not him. <laughs> okay. So we move to approve. Second. Yep. Yeah. Second. And any changes? Ask. Ask if there's any changes. Are there any changes? No. No changes. So noted. Approved. No. Any objections? Any objections? I've adopted the agenda. That actually is. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> back to the script. Okay. All right. So the agenda is approved. Okay. All right. Um, the minutes are open. Now you have to see if there's any changes. So now there are any changes. Any changes to the minutes? Though? Minutes. No changes to me. So minutes stand. Seeing no objections. Seeing no objections. Items approved. Items approved. Yeah. I'm not having any mocus anymore. <laughs> okay. Um, moving on to agenda five. Action items. Okay. First action item 5A Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee appointments. Correct? Right. Yes. So we have two seats that are vacant on the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. We went through the TAC and we have two nominees or appointments suggested. One is for one of the public seats. We have four public seats on the body. And so Chelsea Ward-Waller is the suggested appointee for the, uh, for the public seat, one of the public seats that's available. Um, her information is in, your, in the memo there. Uh, and then the other seat is um, uh, the social, one of the social services seat, or a social services seat. And she works for the Alaska Community Foundation, so it fits the bill there. So Lindsay Hayduke is the nominee for the uh, social services seat and the technical advisory committee recommended approval of both of those two. Uh, I will say that uh, Chelsea Ward Waller did come to the TAC. Uh, I do not see her here today and uh, about an hour ago I received an email from Lindsay Hayduke saying she was unable to make the meeting. So neither of them are here. Neither of them are here today. Okay. All right. Is that it, Kirk? That's it. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Any questions or comments from the committee on these nominees? Do we nominate them both at once or do one at a time? That's what we've done in the past. The group and put the comments are as a group. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. That's the public. Any comments from the public on any of the proposed nominees for the BPEC? Okay. What is the will of the committee? Uh, move to approve. Second. Move to approve by Mr. Wilton, second by Mr. Peterson. Are there any objections to approving the motion? Hearing none, the motion is approved. Okay. Moving on, agenda item 5B, operating agreement update. Uh, Craig, will you go ahead and present on this? Yes. So we had our certification review earlier this year in June, I believe it was. And um, they provided a preliminary report to us. A couple different areas to discuss. But the main one that we would need to, we wanted to deal with right away related to how we do um, amendments to our TIP 
and administrative modifications, what used to be called a minor amendment. What we have done in the past is something that um, wasn't, wasn't exactly what should have been done, uh, but it was with the federal approval, so we thought we were doing what we were supposed to do. And if, with uh, further review, we determined our practice had been, if it was inside of our AMATS allocation that we controlled it was, and we were adding a new project, it was a major amendment. But if it was outside the allocation, but still needed to be shown in the tip, such as uh, the federal transit administration funds that the railroad controls or the national highway system funds that the state of Alaska controls, um, if it was outside of our allocation, then we could add projects uh, as uh, administrative modifications because it wasn't things that we got to vote on, AMATS didn't get to vote on, and we didn't get to control the, the uh, dispensing of that money, so it made more sense to us to just do it that way. And again, all the tips in the 16 years that I've been here and all the administrative modifications have been approved at the end of the day by Federal Highways as okay. So we were under the impression that we were following the rules and didn't know any better because basically the only game in town. Uh, there are not a bunch of other MPOs right next to us to have the chat with and say, oh, you're not quite doing that right. So at the certification review, we were told this is how it should be done and we should, you guys should tighten up the language that you have in there. In addition, there's a memorandum of, a memorandum of understanding between the state and federal highways on what is and isn't a major amendment and what is and isn't a administrative, administrative modification. And AMATS is not a party to that. They're not a signer to that. It did discuss AMATS in there in our tip, but we're not a signer to it. So I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I believe that it would not necessarily be uh, have any power over us because we're not signing it. So um, in trying to figure out how to make sure we follow the letter of the law and clarify our operating agreement, we have the agreement uh, that's before you. And it basically what I did was I took the language in the Code of Federal Regulations, which is our governing statutes, um, and that what they have described is what is a major amendment and what is an administrative modification and I took that and just put it right into our operating agreement to just make it really clear. That's what the feds say is the difference and then that's now what we say. And the only clarifying language that I added in there was, in all, I've done a lot of uh, research recently on the different tip criteria based on the policy committee's direction to revisit the tip criteria before we do another update to our tip. And I looked at a lot of language related to major amendments, administrative modifications, et cetera. And a lot of the different MPOs around the country use a sliding scale based on the percentage of the total project. So in other words, if you're adding money to a phase of a project and it's zero to 25% of the total project cost, it might be an administrative modification. And if it's over that, it could be a major amendment. And I found anywhere from 20% up to 75%. And my thought was, the ability to deliver this program is is challenged sometimes by the fact that we we have our process that we do, which includes going before the assembly to show them a major amendment, and then we have to have it included into the STIP, which is another two to three month process. So we could sometimes have an eight month process of trying to get our amendments approved, and if the project's already in our TIP and we're adding funds to it, let's make it a large number and which is why we went up to the 75%. So if you're adding more money to a project and it's a lot of money, then it would be a major amendment. But otherwise, in order to help us deliver this program, let's make it so it'd be mostly administrative modifications. Long-winded explanation to say these are this change should make it so we, uh, we're very clear on what is a major amendment and what's an administrative modification and what the dollar figure difference is. <laughs> Anytime we add any new project, no matter whose it is, it will be a major amendment. So that's a given, that's the rule. But we can now add money to a project if it's already in the TIP and already going, and we can say we need a little more design funds here, we need more right-of-way funds here, and as long as it's not up to 75% of the total project cost, it would just be administrative modification. We can keep delivering our program and keep getting this, these projects going. That's what we have. It did go to the TAC, and they recommended approval as well. Happy to attempt to answer questions. Questions or comments from the committee? Just a couple. I, I just got off my notes on the TAC. There were, one thing there was someone had mentioned do we need to add language for grandfathered projects? And you didn't make that change. I'm guessing we did you didn't make that change because we didn't really have much discussion on it. The idea being, um, you know, currently the way we operate is, and this is in our policies and procedures, it says 
if a project is already in the TIP and we've been working on it and it's in the construction phase, we automatically approve those um, additions because we don't want to delay, you know, how short the construction season is up here. We don't want to delay those projects by doing a major amendment to add, you know, if they're, even if they're grandfathered, it's a lot of money. And uh, we also don't want to run the risk of saying, well, we don't want to add that extra money to do this, so we're going to kill the project and then we have to end up paying it back. So we didn't add it because we didn't really have enough, we just didn't, we just didn't get to that discussion to really go over it in detail. Um, it's, it's in the policies and procedures, it's just not in the operating agreement. It's, it's how we operate anyway, but we just don't have it codified inside the operating agreement. So it's a clarification as much as anything? So yeah. Well, I, I don't think, I don't know how you would put it in the operating agreement. Because a grandfather project is a type of project. We're not yeah. just we're not defining every single type of project that's in the TIP or the MTP. We're just saying right. if it's in the MTP, regardless of type, whether it's a reconstruction, a rehabilitation, or a grandfather project, it's in the TIP. If you want to put a new project in the TIP, you gotta have a major amendment. Yeah. If you take it out and it triggers conformity or something, like that, it's a it's a major modification. So I don't think having grandfathering a project is Really relevant. Yeah, it's just, it's just a time. what the discussion was like. I think we had some projects in play that might have dollars bumping up, and we didn't want to sabotage them right away. So maybe what you were saying. There's a hand up. Okay. Um, Aaron again with the amounts. I'm the one who brought this up. Is uh, in the amendment we're working on. Is the next business item. Uh, an example is Abbott Road rehabilitation. Is in there as a grandfathered project that has no cost associated with it because at the time we didn't need anything else. But an overrun happened, so money had to be added. And technically, if you follow what we have in our operating agreement, any project cost above 75% of the total project costs or increase above 75% is a major amendment. Adding any money to that project is technically above 75% of the total project cost shown in the TIP. So, so the TIP or the life of the project? Yeah, yeah, so it's it's in the TIP. Oh. So the problem we get is if we sit there and start adding in money for the life of the project any of our grouped projects like pavement we have to show from the beginning of time the amount of money we've spent on that mm -hmm. and then that starts getting into it, it became a problem so this is one of those special exception issues that are in the gray area and i we didn't know if we should yeah. we didn't know how to spell it out in a way that didn't make it seem like it was funny we wanted to be clear on what we were doing and we didn't know how to do it at this point yeah, because the project is in the previous tip. It's been in the last several tips, and it's funded for construction, and they're doing that right now. But we we got to add more money, five hundred thousand, to finish it off. But there's there are no dollars shown in this particular nineteen to twenty two tip. It's just to be common sense wise. You just do a modification. You don't yeah. do a full amendment. It does seem like that. <laughs> common sense would say yes. Can that be added then? I mean, you say something if there's a project already funded in the TIP, already funded. Zero was, we call it funded even if it shows up as zero? It's not. I'm thinking instead of saying the life of this TIP, you could say the life of the project or total project well, costs. Meant, and that total just, project. But then we'd have to start showing it in the TIP if we wanted to do that. Because then somebody would need a way to be able to compare what that is. And there's no way to have it classify or qualify under the phases definition because it says uh, <clears throat> where did I just I just lost it I'm sorry um, change greater than or equal to the total project cost of all phases shown within the approved tip is there any leeway under the phases for this weird example no because we don't show any phases for this project in the tip because we don't show any previously associated costs sure. with this project well, maybe if you said something like um, final construction overrun because it's the end of the it's the end of the end you know this is ending it's it's not it's not it's a it's an exception because there won't be a, a um, an amendment for those end of construction final adjust cost adjustments that could be needed close that you know, finish well, the project yeah and I, I think if you look at this project in the tip it's the third grandfather project in the roadway improvements you know it just shows the 500,000 in 2019 but the rest of the college of zeros but in the description it says 1.5 million in right-of-way funding is advanced construct from 15 into 14 and 7.7 .7 million in 
construction funding is advanced construct from 17 into 16. So those are dollar figures that are shown in this particular tip, and that 500,000 is certainly less than 75% of the, the dollar shown. That it's just not in the call. Yeah. That works for me. I would yeah. just say it's already taken care of. The only other thing you could do is under the column that says estimated total project cost, you would have to add the money in there um, of what was in the previous tip. Well, and this can't be the only project we've had that has had uh, ended up costing more than one year. Had it, it's not, but it's just the only one that has a, a zero because we weren't planning on, we thought we were done funding it. And then it's just the nature of the beast, as you know. You, Here's the project cost. Granted, the more fill needed, or there's a little sliver you needed to take you didn't think about and, or didn't realize, or whatever. So it's just the first time since I've been here with and didn't think if that we were done. So. But I'm comfortable. I have another question. I'm good. Oh, another question. Okay. Um, and just to see how this plays out, just uh, I'm going to say some dollar amounts that could be vastly off. Feel free to correct me, but I would look at like the O'Malley Road project, which very extensive, but I think there was one area at Independence and O'Malley cost a huge amount of money for it. I think at one point we added five million. I think we added another eight, or maybe it was three to total eight, but it was at separate times over, and I just saw it came through the assembly. Mm -hmm. it was, we must have seen something. Maybe it's saw something here, but the approval came from the assembly. So we say 75%, but what if you break it up over, for no bad reason, it's just it took two years to build it, and they discovered more money, and it's over a couple of years, you hit your threshold of 75%. Well, it's, I mean, the amendments are, what's the dollar figure of the amendment at the time, not the cumulative amendments. So, that's... I think it's an exception that says by, the, by if you're through construction, you know, 50 to 75% of construction, the project is through that much. At that point, you just add money as needed, if, if it's needed, for the unexpected, because you're not going to stop it. So why would you go through a major amendment right. to put money into something that are a project that's only in its own done? It's just a final wrap up. So, so are there cost overrun clauses in, in these contracts on a regular basis, or? I don't, I don't have that answer. What was the question? Are there cost overrun clauses uh, in these contracts normally? Most of the time. Hmm. Tim Ammons and Alaska DOT, yes, it's fairly normal to have adjustments to the final project total at the end of the job. Well, sometimes they go up, sometimes they go down, and often the intermediate stages also have adjustments at the last minute. So, Jim, have you ever seen one hit 75% the cost overruns? That would be unusual, but the example that uh, Aaron was pointing out is we had put the bulk of that money in the previous tip, so this tip's basically showing a zero placeholder, and that's the problem. Because we left a placeholder in there knowing there was a change order coming, but the 75% of zero right. is where we're running crosswise. I know, I moved on from that because they got the numbers in there. I, just, I suppose the $50 million O'Malley Road went to $85 million. Now you've gone up 75%, and but then what happens? You're in a construction season. You have to go through this process. I guess we have a special meeting and we do it. But is that, is that realistically ever happen? Not yet. They'd probably fire me if I did that. So. <laughs> okay. Quite the overrun. Quite the overrun. Yeah. I'd probably be needed to do a job. Okay. I, I just, those are some questions we had here. Then I guess one other if I can. Would this change our, we have our um, public participation plan? Does any of this require changes in that? No. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Okay, any comments or questions from the public? Please remember you have three minutes to state your. Okay. What is the will of the committee? Move to approve. Second. Debate on it. Does someone sign this or not? They do not. No. Okay. There's actually a separate clause later in the operating agreement that okay. governs how amendments are made to the operating agreement, and they are made by us. So, hearing <coughs> no objections, the motion is approved. 
The last action item, agenda item 5C, 2019-2022 TIP Administrative Modification Number 2. Greg, would you please go ahead and present this? So here will be our first administrative modification under our new operating agreement. <laughs> Although we would probably have to get defense approval first, but anyway, it works either way, really. Uh, so there are just some minor change, relatively speaking, uh, some housekeeping changes in here, and then some other stuff, and I'll go through those. You have the memo, you have the uh, tip tables as well. So the memo is usually pretty self-explanatory, but um, we have um, usually when we are getting towards the end of the fiscal year, which is what we're doing here, we get to the point where we know that something might slip. And we try to move monies around so we save them the AMATS allocation. And the two places that we usually move them to are either payment replacement or transit fleet uh, bus replacement. And in this case, uh, the, the projects that are ready in the payment replacement program are fewer, just in terms of things that were shovel ready, to use that term. And so what we're really asking is um, instead of moving them into payment replacement, we're putting more of the money into uh, bus replacement, which clearly they always always need so um, uh, be that being the nature of the beast they run a lot of miles so we have um, some of the funds that were out uh, outlined for payment replacement the 350,000 moving over to transit fleet replacement um, and then uh, some money that was in 19 and then some money in 20 also in the uh, uh, Potter Marsh improvements the Potter Marsh uh, project is one that we that was uh, nominated by the state, I believe, Fish and Game, and um, we had done a Potter Marsh project in about 2004 time frame for the northern northern part of the refuge. Uh, this is a project that was nominated for the southern part. As we looked more closely at what they had suggested, there were a number of things that could not really be funded through our federal funds. Um, we used to be able that we had a category of money that was recreational trails and the projects that we had for non-motorized could be used for more enhancement type features. Uh, the rules have tightened somewhat and now they really have to be connected to uh, transportation use. And so where we used to be able to do a boardwalk to a viewing platform, unless that viewing platform connects to a trail or something, it, we can't use the funds anymore for that. So as we went farther along, we realized these, this just can't do some parts of that. Um, Conical Phillips, in the previous project in the two, early 2000s, uh, put a lot of money into that northern uh, improvements. And uh, we reached out to them again, and they said they're willing to look at the possibility of that. We just found out yesterday that they're willing, uh, the grant that was requested for the, uh, the match for the design for that southern part has been approved. So they, they got that first chunk. They have two or three grant requests in for the rest of the stuff, which would also include that boardwalk, the boardwalk to the viewing platform. So it sounds like that original project, that they, a lot of the original project will come through uh, with any luck. So thankfully to a private partner. So um, the bottom line is all of that stuff just couldn't happen before the end of 2019. So that's why we're moving it out to 2020. Uh, long way of saying that. Um, the roadway tables, we've talked about that. So that's the money for both O'Malley Road and Abbott Road. Um, in addition, the Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue extension, the way it was originally written up, talked about the connection being to the south end of Piper Street. Um, and we thought that that would just remove some of the flexibility because it's possible that we might want to be halfway up to your track and cut across and connect into uh, connect into Piper Street at a little later location. Uh, there are a lot of balls in the air about what might happen with the, the Tudor kind of area, possibly moving the health department in there and some swaps of where the Tudor track is and the bus barn and all that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of stuff that's happening there. And um, in the discussion, it was made sense to take off the words the south end. So it just says connect into Piper Street. You could connect at some point along the alignment and it wouldn't run afoul of what the, the words are there. So that was important to remove that part of the language there. I talked about the table three moving out Potter Marsh improvements already. Um, the table four plans and studies, the Port of Alaska multimodal improvement study, they requested some additional funding to make sure they could do a more robust public involvement uh, process. And so we're moving some monies around to do that. In addition, the University Medical District Transportation Demand Management Study, the TDM study that you folks 
moved the money over there from the Northern Access to UMED study. Um, this was a project that was not, the study itself was not originally nominated. Uh, when we nominate projects, when the municipality nominates projects or when other folks nominate projects, we know that we have to come up with the local match, so we try to budget for that. This one came at the last minute, and so the ability to come up with the local match was very challenging. We, uh, the only way we're going to be able to do that is through in-kind match, through work that's being done by both the traffic department and the uh, planning department, the Long Range Planning Section, stuff that they'll do in conjunction with that study. And they, they agree that it will be a challenge, but they should be able to come up with the total match for this, for this project if we reduce it to $500,000. Um, in addition, as we looked and did the research to figure out what TDM studies around the country cost, 500000 seemed like a more uh, reasonable dollar figure. The 750000 was kind of a back of the envelope thing. And again, if you look at what we do for our update to our MTP, which is the entire AMATS area, including Ch Chugach Eagle River and the Anchorage Bowl, that project cost $800,000. So $750,000 for the UMED TDM study seemed a little high to us as we continue to ground truth the numbers and do some research on what other areas around the country have done with TDM studies, that made more sense to us. And that's what that's how much match we can come up with. Um, and then finally, in table five, we have uh, the multimodal trip planner and smartphone application. That's that Link AK that we've shown before. Um, that was, uh, ended up being housed in the um, public transportation department and they, they've decided they just don't really have the staff available to do the care and feeding necessary for that project, for that application. So they've recommended uh, not continuing with it. And so this was the annual maintenance fee, I believe, for that project, or for that plan, that application. So we're removing that from the tip. Did I, there's James, did I miss anything that really need to be pointed out in that? Okay. That's all from that, and I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, any questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Wells? Um, thanks. So, um, with this um, UMED TDM study, it was knocked down from 750, so, so 25000 a match is could have come up with $25,000 yeah, per match, so you've yeah. got to bump it down. So, if 500000 is not enough, when would we know and what could we do about it? Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a purchasing expert. I don't know exactly their rules, but if we put an RFP out and we say we want you to build X, Y, and Z, um, and we somewhere along the line they say that's not quite enough to do that, uh, you're not able to add more money to it if you're still only asking them to build X, Y, and Z. If you say you want them to build B and X, Y, and Z, you added a component to it and you want more money to be put in it, that's allowable. Uh, but if you're still asking them to do the same thing that was in the original RFP, you can't add money to it because the other people who bid on it and were unsuccessful can say, hey, we could have done it for that amount, whatever. So. I'm not an expert on it, but I've been told that's the layman's version of adding money to it. And if you're not adding new uh, deliverables. So, I mean, what if you put out the RFP and said, here's this huge project we want, and we got X amount of dollars, the whole world knows, and they go, no one bids because they go, it can't be done right for that amount of money. Well, at that point, yeah, we could either try putting it out again, or we could, we could come back to the policy committee and say, the technical policy committee and say, we, uh, we put this out, we were unsuccessful finding any people interested in, in it, and um, what do you think? Should we put more money in there? And then you guys could decide. So what if you got three bidders, might be typical, and you just look and, and it'd be an RFP and you go, none of this really gets us where we need to be. I don't want any of them. Are you stuck? Or can you just stop? No, you say we're stop gonna this. no. Could, could you stop and then go, okay, we gotta find more money? Yeah. And then you could? So could delay it. When would an RFP go out on this? I mean, it's so scheduled for I'll bet. chime in on two points here. First, on the total cost of the TDM study, I, I want to reemphasize that <coughs> staff did a lot of research looking at other jurisdictions, 
and I am not an expert in TDM, but I was shocked at the price tags in other cities because of how low they were. Um, and initially, I thought that seems strange, but as you look at the, and, and I don't know if our study will mimic 100% of the outcomes that were found in other cities, but if you look at the size of the areas that some of these other jurisdictions are talking about and the dollars that they put into their study, it was really astronomically different and shocking. So I think first and foremost, uh, based on the survey that staff did and presented, it's pre I'm pretty comfortable that we have more than enough money to do it. Uh, secondly, the procurement process that you're talking about here is not entirely the procurement process that we envision following with this. And in particular, because uh, it was unknown exactly what we would get for that amount of money, we decided that the best approach is to flip the script, script really and ask what, you know, and use an RFI uh, procurement process that can result in, a, in an award. But what what is it that, you know, we can get if we do this. So rather than, uh, I think your example, your example of saying we want everything in the kitchen sink and we have this amount of money, I think part of the conversation needs to be here are our objectives and goals and here's our pot of money. What do we get for that? And we'll have a stronger sense of whether or not there's a deficiency in the funding because at the end of the day, um, that additive process that we, you were describing earlier could just never be ending. Right. Um, so that's that's one difference in the way that this planning project is going to proceed in the procurement phase than a traditional planning project where we just throw it out and say, give us this. The other thing I'll add to that is that um, procurement's required to select the lowest bidder. So um, not only do we have to set very clear expectations up front of what the product is because there may be um, proposals that we like, we think get closer to it, but they're always gonna go with the lowest bidder. So it's really important that we carefully and narrowly define uh, what it is that we wanna get. It's also part of the reason why the, the RFI with award process has, I think, more value for us because we don't have to hold ourselves accountable to the lowest bidder. <coughs> I mean, you could do an RFP though, right? Because I mean, I've been on two committees with mm -hmm. RFPs that use, I think, amounts of money for this part of it. Right. And then you don't have to go with the lowest bidder. You have scoring and so on. There, uh, I mean, price was like ten percent. Yeah. So that's that, that that that's part of it. But again, you don't know what you're asking for. Mm -hmm. so. my, my worry. That's a lot of money. Five hundred thousand bucks. But we had a freight mobility study. We paid over two hundred thousand dollars for it, and I kind of had the impression it was like a high school book report. <laughs> and. Then it might have got improved and it was like a senior in high school book report for a quarter of $200,000. You know, I'm going, I don't always get much for huge amounts of money. So the, 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 the descoping of this wasn't necessarily based on a match on availability issue, it was based on kind of a national research effort about what these things are. Well, the first, there have been two uh, uh, reductions. The first was to $750,000. And then the uh, presentation that staff made to TAC was this is the match available, uh, the in-kind match available to, to meet the match needs. And based on the, own, you know, the availability of match, we think it should be $500,000. Add to that the fact that all of the information that's out there demonstrates that $500,000 has been spent on much more substantive uh, TDM studies in larger areas and I feel with a high degree of confidence that, and I think staff did a good job presenting it, that that's more than enough. Yeah. Any other discussion at the committee level? Okay, we'll go ahead and open up to um, to the public. I, again, I'd like to remind folks, I know there, there, there's probably a little consternation about this issue, and I know, uh, but if you would please try to keep your comments and questions to the three minutes. After you get done with that, we can provide some feedback from uh, the MAT staff on some of those questions and concerns, and then we can, of course, have follow-on conversations afterwards uh, if it is so needed. So, with that, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment again. If you would, uh, when you stand up, please state your name for the record and stay within the three minutes. So, who would like to be first? 
Marcus. Yes, ma'am. If you would state your name. My name is Barbara Carl, K A R L. And um, uh, a year ago, fall, when uh, all the comments were made about the, the TIP, uh, I spoke, I submitted comments then and requested that a TDM be ha happen for the, that whole area based on the UMED uh, planning document. Uh, and that that occurred. And my understanding is at that point, $1.5 million was allocated for that particular TDM. Um, and subsequently, through negotiations, it was reduced to 750000 uh, With, Without notice to the public or minimal notice, I was not aware of it until after this was suggested to be reduced to 500000 And I think that the public should have a an opportunity to weigh in because the whole the original TDM was for a widely focused document study of the UMED transportation area and I'm not convinced that 500,000 will do it and I'm, I'm not a technical uh, expert in that area but uh, uh, you get what you pay for and if you don't have enough money to pay for the adequate study and you define it differently, you're not going to get what you really need. And I question what would happen if you left it at 750000 went out for an RFP, and it re came in at less than 750000 but uh, more than 500000 What would happen with the rest of the money? Could it then be transferred to another project? Thank you. Was that a was that a question for yes. staff? Oh, okay. We weren't sure who you were asking. Okay, I'm sorry. Kurt, do you want to maybe capture the highlights in response? To uh, well, to, to answer the question about if there were leftover funds, we always, as we just did today, we move funds around, and usually they go into replacement buses or payment replacement. So we always try to use the AMATS allocation with inside the AMATS area. If it gets to the end of the year and we don't use it, then DOT attempts to use it hopefully in central region, but sometimes statewide. So um, that's the gist of that, I guess. Okay. And do, you, do we have a public participation process plan, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, we, we, we post our agendas a week in advance of our meeting, so we posted it a week in advance of the TAC meeting recently, and then a week in advance of this meeting that shows the reduction in funds. Um, with the public participation. Right, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, who would like to speak next, please? My name is Carolyn Ramsey, R-A-M-S-E-Y. And I'm here on behalf of CRD UMED and also on UACC for their request because they couldn't get anybody here on such short notice. It's kind of funny that we could find a match for 2.5 million for a road and for that, but we can't find a match for this. The other part, there's multiple issues with this. One of them that the notice that this was being reduced was put out in a memo dated July 11th, which was the same date as the last meeting for the Technical Advisory Committee. So how is the public supposed to know when it's put out on a memo for that day and is buried in the memo on the back of the second page, not even reflective of the title of such a hot button issue? That's kind of, it's, this all kind of goes back to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and, you know, how we're going to notice the road, the intergalactic bypass there. We're going to bury it in the bottom. The other part of this is the fact that there was no outreach to the public. There was no outreach to CRD. There was no outreach to UACC. Nobody on this issue to say, hey, you know, the Muni is really strapped. We've got a problem. All of us see what's happening in Juneau. We all see what's happening nationally. We're not blind to that. We're very well aware. But did anybody reach out to us and say, you know what, we're $25,000 short to try and do this. Mind you, no other project in this has been defunded. The RF RFI has not been put out, which the RFI has to go out first because we don't even know if we're asking for the right thing. The road was based on traffic coming in from the valley. The TDMS, or the TDF, the TDMS also has to include that kind of stuff, which is a much broader range than most TDMS has done in the lower 48. 
that needs to be considered. But did anybody come to the public and say, hey, we're running short. Is there any way you guys might be interested in chipping in? You'd be surprised how many people would actually volunteer their own money to do this right because they care that much about this area and this project and are so vested. None of that was done. So I'm here today taking time off from my own work on my own dime and paycheck because the public process is bad and because of the way this was done was wrong. And it was extremely disingenuous to do this 11 days after the MTP 2040 plan came out with this fully funded at the $750,000. And that came out for public review. How, how can you say to the public, hey, by the way, what do you think of this? Send us your public comments. And 11 days later, defund something in the bottom of a memo on the back page of something you didn't even title. Thank, Thank you. you. Kirk, do you want to respond to me? Uh, the only clarification is that the difference between match for plans and roads, they're completely different pots of money. The municipality can use their uh, bond funds for road projects and construction projects, and they cannot be used for planning projects. So planning projects either have to be uh, a check written out of the budget that is included in their budget for the year or in-kind match. So it's a little easier to move funds around for construction projects because the municipality can bond from either in a road bond or a parks bond or things of that nature. So. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. I don't know if this is appropriate to ask you a clarifying question about a question she asked you. Is that okay? What, um, here. the packets for TAC or for us uh, for policy committee, when are they published? Our, our policies and procedures and our public involvement plan require us to post things a week in advance of the meeting. So on, online? Online, yes. And we send out a notice to the public, to everyone who's on our email list. And we post it in several different locations saying, here's the agenda. The agenda is included in the email and there's the link to all the documents. Uh, I don't remember the date of the TAC exactly, June, July 11th, 11th. So it was a week before that when we had this this memo for the TAC agenda. <coughs> that, that, that's fine. And the, so the comment about the date, which I thought was pretty relevant because I looked at the date on our memo that we have in front of us today, and it's today's date. But is it fair to say that when you publish these documents online a week in advance, you're publishing a memo with the date of the meeting on that's, it? Yeah, that's our practice. Okay. Just say, here's, here's when it is. It's for the meeting today. Um, I, I suspect we met technically the letter of the rules and it's just kind of the way it is in government, but it is actually ridiculous to think people would get that email and go, oh, and then happen to know, I better go look at, I mean, you know, it's even how people I like Carolyn who can read this stuff fairly well, to go search through everyone and say, I wonder if my project got cut. Um, it's not realistic. Um, so not, not that I have we do what we do, but we have to be realistic. You know, it, it doesn't really provide reasonable notice to the public. You know, they're very sharp and crafty and well connected, so they're here. But our, our role in that is really weak. <clears throat> okay. Um, Could I add one comment to that? Uh, yeah, I think you had 58 seconds left. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read the agendas. I'm on the email list. I read the agendas and I looked at the TAC agenda. I saw nothing of significance to me and then attend. Had there been something alerting me to the new uh, TDM, I would have been there. Thank you. And somehow I've fallen off the email list, ironically. Okay, well, we can fix that. <laughs> okay. Would anybody else like from the public like to comment on this agenda item? Okay. So, what is the will of the committee? Move to approve. Second. So I'll second it. Are there any objections to approving the motion? Uh, yeah, I have a question. They want to have an And we're voting to approve these changes in, in bulk. Right. That's Correct. That's yes. Problem. So as far as the match goes so to Craig, I guess, or Aaron, um, you know, I look at the Abbott Road. We just rebuilt the Abbott Road. We're putting another half a million in to rehab it. What? 
real. <laughs> are you asking me, do I know what the additional funds are for? Well, it says rehab. I mean, we got to rip up some pretty new asphalt. I see a hand up in the back. That could yeah, it's not my <laughs> Jim Mavis in Alaska DOT, the extra half million dollars is for a change order for the work that was recently completed that hasn't been paid yet. Okay, so it's owed at this point. Okay, gotcha. Okay. It's called rehab because that was the name of the was more than a rehab. I, I know that, but that was the name of Well, I'm glad it's not to rip up brand new asphalt. <laughs> 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 Is there anywhere to get $25,000 in that? Are there other studies? I mean, we can juggle stuff in here. Is there, if we were to approve this and um, is the match comes from planning's work now, right? So when we look at in-kind match, if, if, it's, if it's not a check, so like the Northern, you know, some of the different studies that we do, we plan for it and we know we have to budget in the planning department, we say, okay, here's your check, and we send the check over for whatever thousands of dollars. Um, lately, we've been having to do a lot of in-kind match. You know the budget as well as anybody, and there's no money there. So with in-kind match, what we have to do is we look at people who will be working on the project that are not part of my staff, that are not federally funded, because you cannot use federal funds to match federal funds. So all the work that Aaron is doing on this project, that is zero, you can't use any of that. You have to look at people who are going to be working on this project that are going to be charging to it that are not using those federal funds. And that, for this project, some people in the traffic department, because we'll have traffic counts out there, we'll do different analysis related to this, you know, the safety section that will do that. So they can, change, they can charge to taxpayer funds or whatever pots of money that they get to charge from, uh, charge to. Uh, they can do that as long as it's on this task. They can't just say, well, we did some work uh, on signal timing. doesn't have anything to do with this, but we did some work and we'll just, it has to be on this particular task. So all we could really identify was that we knew that we were going to need some help from folks in the traffic section, and we knew that the long-range planning section was going to help in this a lot because they managed the UMED uh, study, just a UMED plan that was recently done. So they, they have a certain of expert, ex amount of expertise in that. And, you know, the land use side is very, very important for us to be making sure we're connected into. We really couldn't, I mean, we had a lot of meetings with internal agency folks to say, hey, is there any way at all you think you might be able to do this? And these were the two sections that said, we can conceivably see that we can probably do some work on this and we have money that we can use to do that. And uh, even the dollar figure that we were asking for them was a little bit of a stretch, but, you know, if we get some of their hired paid people to work a little longer on it, we can make it. Those are the two entities, the traffic and long range planning section, that said that they could figure that out. The rest of them that we asked, they said I, that we don't see any synchronicity there. Okay, if um, just citizens in the area had a GoFundMe and they came up with, it was probably $22,500 to do a match. Well, again, uh, I guess uh, what Mr. Schutte mentioned about the RFI, the idea being, what do you what do you think it will take to do this, and what kind of dollar figure? I mean, if they come back and say three hundred thousand dollars, then we're way over. If they come back and say seven hundred, then there's a lot of extra money to try and come up with. But uh, we we can take private funding to do that. When we did the um, uh, when we did that freight mobility study you mentioned, we had a challenge coming up with the match for a long time. And Teresa Brewer, who was our modeler, reached out to the Alaska Trucking Association, and she got money from a couple of trucking agencies and the Trucking Association, and I think the Port of Alaska, to provide private funds to do that, or some cases private funds to do that. So it's allowable. We can do it. Okay, so you put out an RFI, and people know you have half a million. So I mean, it's going to focus on that, typically. You want to get. I mean, essentially, it's bracketed by that dollar amount. So you want to really get a bunch of bidders saying, I need three quarters of a million. I mean, it's all going to come in at half a million. I've never done an RFI before, but uh, I'd be surprised if someone looked at the tip and said, oh, there's $500,000 in there. I can do it for three. Yeah. I mean, we're very public. And, put a range and we can in the see RFI. the dollar figure. Yeah. What's that? You put a range in the RFI. Yeah. That's all it is is a request for information. And you just say, 
what did we get for this range of dollars? Or and he, he don't have to put no. five to seven. He put three. Okay. Five, so. Am I allowed to answer for Craig? I guess. Please do. I don't know that. <laughs> 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 the the RFI in this case is is taking all of the input that we've received from the community and the direction we got from the UMED district plan in trying to address this question of uh, uh, mobility to, from, and within the university medical area. The RFI is really saying, here's our global objectives or our global, I guess, questions that we're asking. It's not, hey, I've got $500,000 to spend. What can I get for it? That's more along the lines of RFP. The, the request for information is for us to present our, I guess, our outcomes up front and then gather that information from interested parties on what, through a TDM at least, what goes into achieving those, those big objectives. Um, and that, that it's speaking to the comments you've heard earlier about we don't know what it's going to cost yet. That's exactly why, because we haven't communicated what our expectations are to the professional community for them to come back to us and say, based on what you think you want for this University Medical Transportation Demand Management Study, it's going to take this and this and this and this to deliver that kind of product. And price, at that point, in my, in my opinion, price should not be what you focus on because we, we want to know if we have these community objectives, how to get there. So I think the, the, the dollar limit and you're going to get exactly what you put out there if you put the dollar limit out, I recognize. And so um, I think that was part of our thinking in taking an alternative approach to this. And I've got a question. So, have have we done uh, a transportation demand study on this area before? And if we did, how long ago was it? So, I mean, it's just I an updated study. Or is this new? I don't believe we've ever done a TDM in the city or the state. But we certainly haven't done one since I've been here. I've never heard of doing one around here. So, if 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 you do lay down what your end results are, your end states or your products, and the community writ large comes back and says. Well, you don't have enough here to really fund that level of effort. Can we revisit it at that point yeah. as, a, as a policy committee? That's when we come and back to it. And maybe look at shifting some things if we need to, to to make sure we get that end result? Absolutely. Okay, so this isn't the end of the line for this thing. We just feel, based on national research efforts, that we think we can get the product we need for this amount that we've budgeted. But if it should go over and we can't, we can come back and revisit. Yeah, as long as the RF, as long as you don't have a contract signed and said, okay, do this. Oh, we want to give more money. You can't do that. But if it's not done yet, we the policy committee can make that decision to add more funding into it. So then the timeline for that. I mean, are, are we talking about a 60-day out thing? We should have a good feeling for that, or 90 days out, or what? Do you, what, what how would you estimate that? One to two months. I mean, we're so ironically, even though we're talking about a, um, a RFI, which is kind of outside of the purchasing or procurement world. We're still bound by municipal procurement rules. Uh, purchasing won't let us start work, work on this project until the Torah has been executed, and, and we got that back. And that's, as last I checked, one one to two months out. Yeah. Look at you, Craig. Okay. So, yeah. so within two months, we should know if that five hundred thousand dollar budget will achieve the result we're looking for. As soon as we have that go date, one to two months from here, oh. we then do the the RFI scoping get that out. Okay. I don't know what the turnaround on that would be. I would hope it would be less than 60 days, but okay. we, we literally haven't even pulled the trigger on staff and others working on that part until we get the go ahead. And, and you can't do that because you need the match. So the, the limitation is the match. So the tip is being amended to address the match maximum they have at this period of time. If more match shows up, there can always be adjustments, but there's been no, from what I see, there's been no change in scope. You're putting in as much as you can to the amount of money you have for match. If you have an idea of how to how to go forward, you're not limiting again. You're not limiting the scope, and it can be revisited monetarily if needed if more match is found. I mean, that's the limiting issue. So by the time we're all eating turkey, if I'm doing my math correctly. We should have a feeling about whether or not this is going to be an adequate level of funding. Sure. Right. Yes. Uh, possibly. So this Torah, how is that worded then? Does it give a dollar amount? 
transfer of responsibility is up to 500 thou, or do we say up to It's what's in the tip. The tour is, is just what's in the tip. Oh, it's not for this particular project. No, we're no, oh, sorry. No. Oh, okay. No, just understood. Tour is just because of where the, it's always because we're eight mats and not. Okay. Right. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Uh, just one final comment, uh, which is, you know, we, I think we could improve our public outreach process uh, for AMATs, um, absolutely. And this is one, only one project that has, it's not the only one, but it's one project that has, um, definitely has community interest and room to improve in that regard. But um, I do agree with, with uh, the comments we've heard earlier about some of the uh, opaqueness of, uh, of AMATs. Um, I will I will add though that um, uh, whether you get dropped from the email list or not that that is absolutely critical to people that follow this process and so pay attention to those and you'll while your project or your area of interest may not always be called out in those very uh, vanilla agendas that you see uh, there's a few key words that you want to key on key in on and read the memos when those come up and this is certainly one of them when you're talking tip modifications that's what that means usually is that there's some project or projects that are being changed <clears throat> if you care about those projects you should read all those memos I know I do and maybe as a follow-on comment that's something that the TAC could look into if we if so for instance if, if I want to bring up Kinnikarm Crossing again that should be a buzzword to the Technical Advisory Committee that's a that's a very that's a, a, a project with a lot of public interest and we should be reaching out to communities to make sure they're a, l a little more additional involvement and notification as well, so that it doesn't get to the policy level and then we have another discussion like this. So, so or we just discussion. agree not to say that word. Or we just agree <laughs> not to ever mention that word. Sure. Yeah. I would say this is a very good discussion. So we should have discussions like this. Not very good. I'm getting back to my script here. <laughs> so I believe I have a, a moved and a second. There was some discussion that occurred. Are there any objections to approving the motion? I'm not comfortable with it. That'd be a no. Okay. Only because of that one piece, though. So. Because of my, uh, do you want to do a roll call? Then? Yeah, yeah, do a roll call. A roll call, Mr. Peterson. Yeah, we're just voting by names at this point. Mr. Peterson, here and Yes. Mr. Wells? No. Mr. Shee? Yes. 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 And I am saying yes as well. So the vote is four to one. It's only at the top. It's yes. only at the top. <laughs> <laughs> Given the roll call, the motion moves forward and approved. <laughs> okay. Kirk, are there any other additional action items before we move on to six? No, two? sir. No. Item 6A, Project Update 2040 MTP. Craig, will you be presenting for Mr. Young and Ellen? I'm filling in for Vivian as she's out of town right now. I, Ariel Gay, I'm an AMAP planner. Uh, the 2040 MTP is moving right along. We have the project list uh, out there for the public to review. Um, we're closing on the ending of public comments the end of July 29th. At 5 p.m. is the end of public comments. So uh, get your comments in. Uh, yesterday, we had a robust Citizens Advisory Committee meeting uh, with a lot of comments. Uh, so you'll see some of those comments coming forward. Uh, it was a really good meeting because it was comments on the projects and also on the process itself. So you'll see the comments on the projects and then the process one. We're still kind of analyzing what we want to do on it. So um, uh, I, I liked it. Uh, one of our CSE members, I think only one is here. So um, I just want to say, Thank you for helping us with putting that together and stuff because it was a really good meeting. So, uh, the plan I believe is to try and bring the comment response summary to the TAC meeting in August, and then to the policy committee uh, in August for final of that, and then we're going to start working on the actual public review document itself. Any questions or comments from the committee? Where was it at? The CAC is uh, room one seventy. In the uh, permit, so you don't sit it at the permit center. Yes, uh, forty-seven. So, sorry, what? If you had to guess, what was the attendance? Oh, members of the public. Yeah. No. Yeah, because I mean, the reality is, is 
the CAC members uh, are kind of that representation of the public itself because they are supposed to represent their communities sure. for whatever they so how many CAC members? Uh, every everybody except Bruce Bustamante and uh, SJ Klein one of our new members oh, uh, so right. it was nine yeah. nine of the 11 members okay. which is good and they all participated so it's awesome <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. I didn't get to go. Um, what was the flavor? Give us just a quick flavor of what some of the comments were on process, not on product, but on process. Uh, Process-wise, I believe a lot of it was just uh, concerns that some of the public comments were not being listened to with some of the projects that were being incorporated into the project list. Good example is a lot of the comments in the surveys talked about doing something as an alternative to automotive uh, or a single occupant vehicle, really. Um, and then the projects don't necessarily reflect that when you have things like the Midtown Congestion Relief Project in there or the uh, Seward to Glen Highway Project uh, portion in there. That was the big one. Um, and then you have some things like the Multiway Boulevard was not in there for an actual project itself. The Minnesota Drive Multiway Boulevard project was not in there. Um, and then some other, other, not smaller projects, but other projects that are as important. Um, and then in terms of other process pieces, I think it was just um, making sure that whatever we're putting out there is as reflective as possible of the comments. And probably a lot of that, what goes along with it, is trying to explain to people kind of what our limitations are on projects that we can move forward on. Like, you know, transit was a big comment. Why are we not doing more transit? Well, we have limited funding for that, so we can't do any more transit. Trying to get that information out to people. Any other comments or questions from the committee? I do have one other thing, sorry. Uh, there is an MTP performance measure meeting coming up with the TAC, CAC, and Policy Committee, where we're going to be taking a look at the performance measures that were recommended as part of Tech Number 1A way back in 2017. Um, taking a look at which ones we want to move forward with for the MTP. Currently we have about 57 performance measures. Uh, that's a lot of data gathering for staff to do, so staff's going to be coming forward with some recommendations on which ones we can uh, kind of delay for later time when we can have better data gathering options or, and then which ones we can move forward on. So uh, that is scheduled for August 7th from 2 to 4 p.m. in the Mayor's Conference Room. Okay, so I got that, and that's good. Are you going to uh, send us information prior to that? Because I sometimes we do these two-hour meetings. It's not enough. Yes. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, to be frank, we're probably going to have to have multiple meetings. This is a very dense subject. It's a very technical subject, even more so than the uh, fiscal analysis meetings, and we had a couple of those. So, uh, I just kind of want to give you a heads up that uh, we may need a couple of them. Uh, I'm going to try and provide snacks. I don't know what to help. <laughs> people focus um, <laughs> if, you think, if you think there's going to be a need to two to three it would be really helpful if you just go ahead and schedule on our calendars at two more meetings otherwise it's gonna get really difficult at least for my schedule to squeeze something in less than a week even less than two weeks at this point so if you could go out and schedule them in then I have a much higher chance of, of making it okay yeah the first one gives us an idea of Two more, three more, four more. I just set up two more meetings. after that. Set up three. Um, yeah. Okay. We'll do that, and we will send out information to the committee members before the meeting, so you have a chance to review the recommendations. Uh, it probably will be next week sometime. I apologize that it's kind of not two full weeks' notice, but with Vivian out of town suddenly for family stuff, I'm having to hold off on doing anything until she gets back. But we're pretty much done. I just need her kind of final blessing on it before we can send it out to everyone. Anything else, sir? Any other comments, questions? Okay, seeing none. Uh, are there any comments from the public on the MTP 2040 update? Carolyn Ramsey, again. Um, it would be really nice if you could notice on the MTP somewhere that, by the way, you've defunded the TDMS by $250,000 because on that list, when you go in there on the web, it's there, 750000 People don't know. So, short of us contacting everybody, that's kind of hard. Thank you. Are, are changes in the MTP, will they be shown or, or highlighted somehow for this upcoming meetings? Well, the thing is, is we haven't closed the public comment period. Okay. 
and this change for the TDM study came after we released the public comment period. Okay. So, yeah, so how are we supposed to comment on this? It's really kind of complicated. So we haven't shown any changes in the project list yet because we haven't finished with the public comment period yet. So in theory, the way Carolyn would know that this change would be by attending the TAC and the policy meetings. And then since the public comment period is still open, she would comment to you while the public comment period is still open regarding her concerns on that change, correct? Yeah, and yes. Because we do, we do clearly show the TDM study change in the TAC memo and the policy committee. I'm sorry you have to dig, but it's but not the, the only person project. doesn't know to dig, and that's part of the problem. Not the I'm not project. saying I'm above average. I've just been doing this a while. I'd like to speak just to the CAC meeting yesterday. I um, say your name. Oh, sorry, Kelsey Ralph, R A L P H. Um, I, uh, you'll obviously get a full report from Aaron, who was excellent. Um, the CAC members voted to suggest to you to move the Midtown Congestion Relief projects from short term into long term, and then long term into illustrative for the respective projects. And of course, we'll get the list from Aaron. They also had a number of projects that they'd like to prioritize instead, many of which promote multimodal activities in line with what the public says that they want. Um, and they also uh, voted to recommend a study of tolling on the Glen Highlight. So just so you're aware, these are things that you'll be discussing, I'm guessing, in the next meeting, but I wanted it on your radar. Um, Aaron will forward the work, and then um, I'll send an individual comment as well. Any other comments from the public on the MTP 2040? Okay. Um, item 7, general information. No. I'm sorry, 6B. Ross, I'll just back up. Item 6B, updates the TIP obligation So you have the obligation report in front of you. This is uh, third quarter. Basically, this is the most part of keeping you up to date, and it's reflective of uh, what was in the, the admin line. So most of that stuff's already in there. We're at the point where we need to be within plus or minus 5% uh, of what the, of the allocation is, and we're at minus 2.46%, so we're right where we need to be. Um, we won't go over in detail because we talked about most of those changes already in the admin line, so. But happy to answer questions unless I missed anything. Did I miss anything earth shattering? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, committee is open. Any general information from the committee? I do. Yes, ma'am. So I just want to give everybody a heads up that DEC has been working on the second 10 year limit and maintenance plan for Eagle River. Hopefully, we'll get it to AMATS for next month. Um, if we can't get it out for the TAC to release for 30 day public comment, we'll might have it for the policy committee to release for 30 day public comment. Um, we already met with staff. We've already had a draft. The draft has gone to EPA. We've had an interagency consultation. We are working through EPA's comments right now on that preliminary draft. And as soon as that gets done, um, we're hoping to give it to AMATS. Then AMATS will run it through the process, go out for 30 days public comment, and come back to the TAC, come to the policy, and then we'll go to the assembly. And then we'll go to DEC. We'll put out our public comment period hopefully around January, then we'll uh, close that out and hopefully get it out to formally to EPA in the spring of 2020. So it originally, the original due date for updating that limited maintenance plan is 2021. EPA doesn't start your 10 years until they approve it. So we figure if we get it in in 2020, hopefully they'll approve within the year and we'll go straight from one 10 year to the next 10 year cycle and we won't have any more delays. Um, the advantages of it at, at the end of that 10 year period, uh, we will be designated attainment. We have no exceedances or any increase in our, our PM10 pro any issues in the PM10. And then we will no longer have to do conformity within that area. So it's a long time coming. We're working on it. But I just want to give everybody a heads up that we're hoping in August that we'll be able to kick off the AMATS process for that e River limited maintenance. A couple comments from DOT. Um, 
I'd like to reemphasize a lot of fake news going around about the capital budget. Uh, things will not come to a grinding halt at the end of July should they not shoot past the capital budget. Um, our capital budgets allow the state to receive funds from Fed Highways and FAA. Uh, they also include match funds to, to match those funds. We don't have a capital budget yet, but the capital budget is based on a federal fiscal year cycle, not a state fiscal year cycle. So we have enough to get through to the end of September, in theory. It does reduce our flexibility the closer we get to that date in terms of shifting funds between program years, but uh, things will keep moving. Um, we're confident the legislature will pass the capital budget. Um, but uh, the sooner they do, the better. So, yeah. Any questions on the capital budget? Okay, operating budget. Um, there was a cut to the department again this year. Um, Central Region's piece of that is around three quarters of a million dollars. Um, a lot of that will transfer into vacancies straight to our maintenance and operation folks, which will increase the response times and the priority of road depending on where you live. So right now, I think for instance, it's uh, 24 hours, 36 hours, 42 hours, for instance, for the priorities two, three, and four, those time response times will only increase as we reduce our maintenance and operations personnel. We'll most likely be closing another maintenance station. We've got a couple down on the Kenai Peninsula we're looking here right now, but again, that will reduce our response times uh, on those roads as well. Um, we took a $21,000 hit to our aviation uh, program. We'll be turning two uh, rural airports into backcountry status, mean, meaning not maintained. Um, they're out on the Waikia Delta, so I don't know that that'll impact Anchorage necessarily, uh, but two airports out there will be uh, not maintained um, and we took a $60,000 hit to our travel budget uh, for our maintenance folks which will be translated into commodities but still another hit as well so um, we're very much uh, looking for input from other organizations that take hits because DNR for instance is taking a, uh, a large hit their division of agriculture is almost going away which they certify all our seed uh, for our projects so that's an impact to us so and in the communities as well, we're continuing to work with the municipality and the boroughs to determine what those cuts will be as well. So challenging times to be sure. Um, another thing I wanted to add, and this is really again to reiterate to the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, uh, we really appreciate folks stepping up to that, but from the department's perspective and the municipality as well, um, we see a lot of advice coming out of there that is really bike centric and not pedestrian centric. The reality is if you look at the numbers, we've had 21 pedestrian fatalities over the last two years and we've had one bike fatality. So while I agree that everyone's important, uh, the statistics are kind of telling and it becomes a real challenge when we get a lot of folks that want us to pour a lot of effort resources into just bicycle things and not necessarily pedestrian things. So I would ask uh, that if you're on that bike and pet committee or that you attend those, if you would please jump up and down a little bit and pound your fist and let's not forget the pedestrians that are out there because they are actually the ones that are that statistically are the fatalities not necessarily the bicyclists and if you could keep that in mind it would certainly help us to make sure that our priorities are aligned with the data that we are challenged with so if you could uh, echo that to those folks i would appreciate it so with that are there any other last committee comments Okay. I actually have a comment. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, and, and um, I, I think reality is, is starting to set in. Uh, the situation with uh, the cuts uh, to the to the budget in Juno and the, the long running special sessions. Uh, I, I just think this is the beginning of uh, we're going to see additional cuts coming up. Uh, in future years as well and so having to make changes to some of our long-term plans uh, is probably something that's going to become more of a normal thing and as, as far as the dropping of, of the, the study from a $750,000 study to a half a million dollar study I think a half a million dollars to study anything is a hell of a lot of money <laughs> I think I'm in the wrong business you should have been in the study business instead of the pizza business because it was a hard to make a hell of a lot of money in the pizza business where it sounds to me like a half a million dollars in the study business there's got to be some got to be some money to the bottom line there somewhere so I, I know some of the public think that that cut uh, is, is is a negative thing and we may we may get an inferior study <clears throat> but I think we should be able to expect more 
for a half a million dollars than what we have been expecting in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Any other committee comments? Okay. Are there any public comments in general? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Kelsey Ralph for the CDC. Um, and so we heard a lot about the public participation process and some issues with it. Um, and I know that the, pro the plan for that is under review, but I just wanted to speak to the committee um, about how public input is currently being used in the decisions that you make. So for example, in the MTP, um, the technical working paper number three describes this as being part of the public participation process. That's what's primarily driven the choices that we've made and then goes on to pretty blatantly mischaracterize what the public outreach has found so far. Um, I don't believe that this is uh, the fault of any one person on staff. I think they're all wonderful. Um, but it is true that we have conducted two studies and a series of charrettes to figure out what the public wants. And in reviewing those documents, it is very clear to me that the public would like alternatives to the automobile, no matter how you ask it. Um, the survey itself, the, the, the um, document describing the survey itself, can make the same exact conclusion. Then, in characterizing the results of the survey, the technical working paper number three, the document that supports the MTP, um, says we have support for both of the options that we explored. We saw support for adding road lanes, even though no matter how you slice it, that's not what the public said. And so I think that we need as a group to work on who we outreach to, um, but also how we use that data. And I think it's on your shoulders to actually use what the public would like to see. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Any objections to approving the motion? Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned at 247.